The United States is in trouble today, not because Satan has gotten stronger, but very often because God's children have become less involved. We have been given one of the greatest stewardships the world has ever seen. That's a stewardship of our country. We take for granted what most other citizens of other countries never even dream of. Uh, you go to, uh, we used to call them the Soviet bloc countries. Uh, the people there had no voice in their government. So they just didn't. Uh, where you've got socialism going on, yet no voice. It's just a government basically taking and telling and distributing. This country, one of the very few, I would tend to say the only one, but very few, where from the very beginning it was set up that every generation will have the country they want. That's the stewardship we have. If the country today is not what it ought to be, it's not the Constitution. The Constitution gave us the opportunity to form the country the way we want. If we don't do it, it's not the government's fault, it's our fault. Uh, we understand, we've seen this before, that our country, the laws of our country, the foundational law of the Constitution, will not work outside of a Christian country. It won't. We've lost battles because we've not shown up. Sometimes we lose battles because we're ill-equipped to fight them. You may not know this, but uh, about 20 years ago, uh, things got so bad in Lake County educational system that a lot of Christians got together, and of the five-member uh, Lake County school board, four were very vocal, very clear, biblical Christians. Well, not so much. Uh, they should have had the opportunity to really direct and to make an incredible impact. They were so ill-prepared and ill-equipped that after their terms were up, I'm not sure we've had one elected since. You see, our heart can be right, but if we're not prepared, if we're not equipped, it's going to be a disaster, isn't it? Uh, you can be a, a committed, patriotic American going forth to battle, but you've never been to boot camp. You don't know, have any weapons. You don't know how to use them anyway. And you're going to go forth and fight an enemy. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to die. It has nothing to do with your heart. Nothing to do with your commitment. You're just ill-prepared. We've already dealt with the issues in our study. This is part eight of... Being committed. First off, getting into the battle, getting into God's army. You've got to be saved. You've got to be born again. And if you're not sure you've nailed that down, before you leave this morning, would you please do that? Uh, I want you to, but that's not the issue. The issue is heaven or hell forever. Uh, the issue is uh, God's blessing and power in this life or his judgment. It matters in time and eternity whether you're saved or not. So when you get saved, then you've got to make the decision, are you going to join up or not? <clears throat> Jesus said, and I want to, we haven't said this for a number of weeks. Jesus said at least twice, except, except a man deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, he cannot be my disciple. Okay? A couple things he was saying. Number one is every Christian is not a disciple. Because none of that is a requirement to be saved. The tragedy is a lot, of dis a lot of Christians will not make the discipleship decision to get into the fight because it will demand we deny what we want and take up what God wants. It will demand uh, that we bear suffering that otherwise we wouldn't have to bear. And then we've got to learn of Jesus if we're going to follow him. And none of that is easy, but all of that is required if we're to start. This is not the end. This is the start. And in America, there's got to be a wake-up call. Maybe this morning, uh, you know, understand something. God loves you, saved or lost. If you're God's child, whether you're committed or not, he loves you. Do we, under, do we understand? That's, a, that's unconditional. Amen? Amen. A little more enthusiasm would be nice, but that works. Okay, I didn't have to use my sign. Okay. He loves you whether you're committed or not, but the world will not believe you unless you are committed. They won't. 
Oh, I love the Lord, but they don't see him in my life. Oh, Christianity is important, but there are other things so much more important in my life. Not going to believe me. We've got to get into the battle. And we've got to, okay, first off, am I safe? Secondly, am I a disciple? I'm getting in God's arms. Then I've got to train. And we've seen so many aspects of just whether it's God's boot camp. Uh, last week, I, I, primarily it was, but grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and then the put on the whole armor of God. These are our responsibilities. Something I think you're going to maybe be surprised at this morning. A couple of the parts of God's armor are you're in my responsibility to put on and God's responsible to empower it. See that in a few minutes. But there is a great responsibility you and I have. And until we have taken on the discipleship identity, responsibility, we'll never do it. And the battles today are not for spiritual wimps. They're not for folks with good intentions and yet, forgive me, too lazy to train, to get stronger, to put on God's armor. I, 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 I've seen too many of God's children uh, with good intentions going out and getting destroyed because they have not done what they have to do to win. And so that's what we've been looking at these few weeks. Um, the title of the, uh, the series is Able to Win. Now remember, the war is won. That's not the issue, okay? Uh, eternity past, that war was won when Jesus Christ rose from the grave. That was the event that empowered all of that. Satan is the banished, defeated enemy. Do we understand that? Amen? Amen. But we have individual battles that we have to fight, and we can win or lose them. And I have seen Christians do both. I want to win. I've never heard a coach get his team ready for a game or uh, general ready for battle. Uh, okay, let's go out there and just die. Let's go out there and participate. You go out to win. And for the Christians, no excuse not to be. We have a relationship that brings the power. We have all the equipment we need. And the equipping is what we're going to look at this morning. Um, let's pray. And then we'll turn our attention to Ephesians chapter 6, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for giving us a church home where we can come and we can study your word. Father, I pray that as we do this morning, we will do so with a, a mixture of excitement, of victory, but also a sense of responsibility an understanding how serious the battles are, that we're not only fighting for ourselves, but for our loved ones, our neighbors, the next generation, should there be one. Father, I pray that you would not only make us serious and committed, but well-equipped, and then, Father, give us great victories. Let us regain some of the ground that we have lost. Father, I pray for revival, at least in this area. Father, I pray for revival in America. To that end, we ask your blessing this morning. Father, enlighten our understanding, but Father, equip our hearts. Challenge us from our inside out. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 6, I'd like you to follow along as I read beginning in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand firmly. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, a couple of things I want you to notice about the armor and I'm going to get a little picky on the words, but look at verse 14, please. 
Stand therefore, having fastened on. You see those words? Okay. That's a great translation of that verb. It means you put it on before you go to battle. But you keep it on. Look how many things we're supposed to do before the battle. Having put on. Okay, having fastened the belt. Having put on. Those are imperatives. That is preparation before the fight. If you wait till the crisis is there, if you wait until the battle is raging to put your equipment on, you're going to fail. There's a preparation for fighting. Uh, Again, you know, and I've shared it before, I've never gone into a battle. I've never gone into a military conflict. I've known a lot of folks, and I have grilled a lot of folks who have. And I am so grateful. Uh, the body armor today, you compare that to what they had in World War I and II, is a, a different universe. But you don't wait till the IED explodes. You don't wait till the bullets are whistling around you to put your flak vest on, to put your body armor on. You don't wait till you're a mile or so into the march before you put your shoes on. You don't wait to put your ammo belt on. These are things you do when you have time to do it before the conflict explodes. In my life, and I I can now speak as one who is well aged. Well, I don't say aged well, but well, I'm old. Okay? I have looked and watched Christianity America. I love history. I, I, I really love studying history of Christianity in America. But there's the last 50 years, now I'm older than that, but I've been watching and evaluating for about 50 years now. There is a horrible habit we're into that almost explains why we lose so often. And that's that we don't bother preparing until the battle's raging. And we wonder, and it's maybe because we have this, again, this bad teaching in churches sometimes, sometimes, where it's all of God and none of us. In fact, sometimes this passage is gone to, and it's one of the, do you ever have somebody quote something and you say, well, you missed the front part of the back part of the verse? Well, you know, the Bible just says you want to win battles, just go forward and stand. All you got to do is stand. Go to Ephesians 6, it says stand. They're ignoring the context. They're ignoring the commands that will enable us to stand. Guys, we go forward And yes, we stand in the power of God in his might. And we'll look at that briefly this morning. But there's a preparation. There is a growth. There is a strength that is required. Otherwise, we're going to lose our battles. Not the war. The war secured. But if we lose enough battles, we can lose our families, can't we? We lose enough battles, we can lose our neighborhoods and our communities. We are living proof, our country, the United States today, it is not what it was. Sometime, if you get a chance, if you can find any histories of the Puritans and Quakers in this country, man, people think that had to be a horrible, structured, a terrible place to live, and yet there was more joy, there was more love, there was more peace than you and I can imagine today. More security than you We just can't imagine. Why? Because they were fighting the battles, they were winning them. They were winning their homes, their neighborhoods, their communities. They were not perfect. And there were some things that happened where they stopped fighting. And that's where we are today. Last 50 years, we can see it over and over again. Please understand something. I, I am very grateful for the Supreme Court decisions that happened recent, recently and for hopefully more to follow. But revival will never come through a court. Revival will never come through a governmental party or governmental laws. Revival comes from the heart, from the inside out. And the battles for revival are spiritual. They're not legislative. They're not social. They're certainly not financial. They are spiritual. And we've got to get into the fight. And we've got to fight the enemies that are real. The moment we have the idea that people are our enemy, Satan loves it. Because in this passage here, 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. How can you get clearer than that? If we did, it, that's easy. People are doing that tragically all the time. But our battles, our warfare is spiritual. And the first thing that demands is that we are in fellowship with God and we're equipped and trained from God. It matters. You and I by ourselves cannot win a spiritual battle. You and I on our own are not equipped to be able to even defend against the attacks of Satan. We're going to see that in this passage. We have got to make that discipleship decision. God, I will pay the price to become a disciple. I will deny God. I, I, I've got goals. I've got stuff I want in my life. I'll set them aside. And we may be like Isaiah when God uh, said, okay, I'm going to send you forth to a people that are not going to listen. You'll make no difference. First thing out of his mouth was, okay, God, but how long? <laughs> how long? Uh, there are times. You know, I look back, and, and I've shared. I, I, I'm not shy about this. I, if I had known the cost of the ministry 40-plus years ago when I entered, I would have done it. I'm not that strong. I'm not courageous. There's a terrible cost. And there's a cost that will never be uh, recompensed in this life. But it will be more than you'll believe in eternity. Are you willing to pay the price to get into the battle? That's denying self. God, no matter what the cost, I will find your will and by your grace I'll do it. I'm going to look for you. Then take up the cross. And that means willing to pay the price, willing to suffer. And that suffering is very, very specific when it says take up your cross. That imagery is used to show these are things that you will sacrifice and suffer that if you were not a disciple, you would not have to suffer or sacrifice. It is your service for God that's costing you this stuff, and it hurts. You willing to do that? Most Christians, the answer is, I'm really not sure. For many of them, it's an absolute no. Life's too good. I'll let somebody else pay that price. I'll cruise on their coattails. Well, at the end of the day, we'll run out of people because the majority is saying no. My prayer is that God will raise up in this church and in thousands of church across this nation, Christians. First off, folks that are Christians are truly saved. Say, God, I will be your disciple. I will be willing to pay the price. God, substitute your will for mine. God, I'm willing to pay the price for such a life, a, a life of loss, if necessary. And God, no matter what, I will follow you. You'll be my leader, my commander. If you say it, I'll settle it. That, that settles it and I'll follow you. And then we can start winning some battles. Because then we start coming here. And we have a command here, finally. And I shared, I think a couple of weeks ago, whenever you see that word in Paul's writings, this is a conclusion. This is something that is important. Don't miss it. Okay? Be strong in the Lord, in the power of his might. You have got to become strong. And how do you get strong? Sit in a chair and watch TV, right? Sit down and watch the world go by. You got to get in God's gymnasium. By the way, that word appears twice in the Bible. I can show it to you sometime. That means getting out in the world and learning to walk in obedience to the word. You start getting stronger that way. You start seeing a strength that is growing in you. You start seeing that God really does keep his word, that God empowers his word, and you become more courageous at the same time. We have got to become strong, and I love the rest of that sentence, in the power of his might. Those two words are not strict synonyms, power and might. The word power means the ability to dominate your foe or enemy. And might means this is a source of the power to dominate. God's might. And the idea, of the, the, the form of be strong is clothe yourself with it. 
cover yourself up with God's strength. That is his power to give us domination, not just existence, not just I can survive, but domination or our enemies. It's about time in America some Christians started getting dominance over Satan, don't you think? Thank you. We have the power. We have the guidance. We have everything we need to dominate Satan and his power. But yet, yet we don't. Why? Be strong. That's my responsibility. Be strong in the Lord and his power that gives that kind of domination. It's a command. It's a command. Well, after we settle that, then God says we need to put on his armor. And before we get into the belt of truth, the first part, it is put on the whole armor of God. You don't pick and choose here. Uh, if you were going into battle and you figured, well, you know, boots are awful heavy, I'll put on a pair of Nikes. <laughs> it will not go well for you. Well, you know the ceramic plates in my, in my vest, the Kevlar. It's kind of hot and kind of heavy. Uh, I'll go in a T-shirt. But I got my weapon. You're still going to die. It is the whole armor. And again, we sometimes don't get it. It is all or nothing. Something that I have been sharing with folks for a couple of decades now is this. 90% finished is 100% useless. And in any machine, that's exactly right. And frankly, what God is saying here, you need the whole armor. You need the whole armor. Now, the next few minutes, we are not going to be looking at the symbols of that armor. It seems like usually that's what happens. You know, the belt, and then we're described what this Roman belt is and all that. Does that really matter? Because it's a belt of truth. What is that? The breastplate of righteousness. Okay, that's my flight jack, but what is it? What is the breastplate of righteousness? We're going to look at this from that perspective. So we'll know what God is saying you need to put on. And frankly, when I looked at that first, uh, girded about, you know, tied around your waist, the bell of truth, I was frankly surprised. Because I was hoping that it would be some kind of a theological thing that God just uh, overwhelms us and surrounds us with and all of this, that's not it at all. The word for truth here refers to our integrity. In fact, the first two or three of these characteristics, of, of these parts of the body armor, refer to our behavior. You put it on. You do this. Now, God supernaturally makes it work. It would be kind of like God saying, put on this T-shirt. I will make sure no bullet gets through. You know what? That's good enough for me. Because when you say, God, that doesn't make any sense. But that's the whole point. When God works, he wants to do it in such a way where nobody else can take credit for it. Now, he is not foolish. He does not do foolishness. But sometimes what he does and commands is beyond our understanding. You're going forth to battle. We have got folks who are trying to destroy the nation. We've got folks who are lying and cheating and stealing and all this kind of stuff. And God begins here with your personal integrity as part of your armor. And he, that God doesn't make any sense. God said, trust me. Trust me. Now, what's interesting is this is called the belt. And again, the, the symbolism is this is what you put on and you hang everything else on it. Or you everything else attaches to it. Uh, and in today's warfare, it would be uh, maybe your, your vest that holds your ammo, maybe some other explosives and all that. But everything attached, and if you didn't have it, everything would fall down. The image here is this integrity, this truth is so important. If you don't have it as the anchoring of everything else, you can't stand and you can't hold the rest of the stuff. 
I am finding myself yearning and wondering if there's integrity anywhere in the world. We had a former uh, town manager, good man. Uh, in fact, the county stole him from Lady Lake. Uh, and we had this talk one time. Uh, I was in his office and said, you know, uh, if we don't have integrity, if our word and our behavior doesn't match our word, isn't worth it, it doesn't matter what we can do. Integrity is everything. And there's a, a, an interesting Greek word often used for a lack of integrity. Uh, and it goes back to Roman theater where their costumes were just masks. And if they had a character that was not the, the actor, they would put the mask in front and speak behind it. And that was their hip, hypocrisy. It's either integrity or hypocrisy. I don't think anybody here wants to be known as a hypocrite, do we? No. But if the world doesn't know we're men and women of integrity, that's what we are. I really think the world is wondering, is there integrity anywhere? And they ought to be able to find it in the church, shouldn't they? Yes. Not coincidentally, integrity is mentioned first. The first thing we are to choose to put on is a lifestyle and integrity, a lifestyle of integrity. It is consistency for the Christian between God's truths and his word and our behavior. You may say, Pastor, my word's my bond. If I say something, you can count on it. Okay, let's go one step further. Do you do anything? Are you doing anything in your life? The Bible says you shouldn't. Or are you not doing it? Some of you Bible say, that's a lack of integrity. You can use the word consistency as a synonym. What you are in here, consistent in what you are out here. What you are in your beliefs are consistent with how you behave. And one of the greatest problems we have in churches today is we want to be situational in our integrity, not biblical. That means absolute. You know, how, how often does God allow me to lie? Never. Oh, come on. Never. What if, what if I really need to? Never. <laughs> Never. What about taking something that's my, not mine? Never. Never. But what if I want it more than you want it? Never. See, that's integrity. And it goes even further. Uh, I'm supposed to love everybody. Oops. That person that just cut me off. I almost got run into three times this week. One of them, to this day, I'm not sure they know they're not in the driveway. Um, it is sometimes hard, but you got to love. You, you have to. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have no excuse for not loving each other, do we? That's integrity, or not. The world needs to see in our lives, in our behavior, in what we do, whether we actually believe what we say we do. And the only way that will happen is they see integrity. And very often the world will see those defects clearer than we choose to. I've seen often the world has a higher standard for our behavior than we have for our own. And that never works out well. So integrity. Put it on. But you do it before the battle. Notice what it said. Having put on. You start here. This is part of our basic training. This sort of getting strong in the Lord, you begin to put on this integrity. Because if you don't have it, Satan and his crowd will nail you. Because when we are hypocrites and they bring it up, we've got no answer because they're right. They're right. Then you, having put on, the breastplate of righteousness. This gives us the courage to enter the fight. Really? If I had to go into battle and all I had was a machete, blue jean sneakers, and a t-shirt on, and I'm going against Russia, the Middle East, whatever, 
Am I going to be very confident? No. Courageous? No. Foolish? Yes. Oh, yeah. There is something, and I've experienced this in some sporting aspects. When you know you are well defended, you can be very courageous. Uh, football can be very violent. <laughs> Not when I play it. Um, but when you put on all the pads, put on a helmet, you can go out and get pretty rough and it doesn't hurt much. Um, in a race car, you may think it's very restrictive. You climb into a roll cage, put a five-point harness on, you snug it up. You can't move very well, but everywhere you look, there's safety, safety, safety. Easy to be courageous in a car. The breastplate is our vest. It protects our vitals. And guys, we've got spiritual vitals. Uh, our, our heart can be broken in battle. We can be so discouraged, we quit. That comes here. Burnout. One of the causes is this. We don't put on this equipment. You've got integrity. You put that on first. That gives you uh, the ability to hang everything else. And this armor protects our spiritual vitals. It covers our, it physically covers our internal organs, our heart, lungs, uh, liver, all the organs. It's our bulletproof vest. And righteousness emphasizes that word. And it amazes. We look at the breastplate of righteousness. We talk about the breastplate, but then we don't talk about of right. What is it? It's righteousness. And that shocked me also the first time I studied this. Because you know what righteousness is? It's not godliness and it's not holiness. Two different words. Righteousness stresses our honest, ethical, or moral behavior toward others. It's horizontal. You mean that matters in our spiritual warfare? Apparently, because God said this is what our breastplate is. This is what covers uh, our internal organs spiritually. And that's my behavior. And it makes sense. Can you differ with someone and still be good friends? You know, something that um, you know, Bill and I have talked about and several others. Uh, back in Ronald Reagan's day, and how many were not even born when Ronald Reagan was, never mind. Uh, <laughs> several of y'all, a lot of y'all. Um, he and Tip, o Tip O'Neill was the sp not sp uh, sp Speaker of the House, okay. Um, liberal Democrat. And Ronald Reagan was a very conservative Republican. They differed on virtually every issue. Now, their goal was the same. They both believed in a strong and warm America. But my understanding is they were close friends. Can you imagine? You mean we can differ and, yeah, we can treat each other right no matter what. In the absolute sense, when it talks about the blessed breastplate of righteousness, that means we even treat Satan's people righteously, honestly. We treat them morally. And I, maybe we've all seen, I've seen this, where when God's children abandon righteousness and take on the methodology of the enemy, we always lose. We always lose. You can't do it. They don't have to fight according to the rules. We do. And I've heard people say, but pastor, if we do that, you can't win. Where's your faith? Where is your belief that God will empower his word and his will? He'll empower the child. And what God wants to do anyway is to so work through his children to bring about victory so that nobody else can claim the credit for it. There was a time when people so clearly saw God at work in the lives of Christians because of their obedience to the word, because of the way they lived and treated each other, they saw God's power in churches so clearly, they were afraid to cross God. You know why there's such an irreverence today toward God? Because they see so little of that power in us. 
Now, I, I, that sounds very harsh. Forgive me. Um, but guys, we, we, we've got to understand the idea of right, the breastplate of righteousness is we fight according to God's rules, knowing that on a human basis we cannot win. So that when we do win, we know who won. And I hope you recorded that because I'll never be able to say that in, in order again. That's what God wants. When we capitulate and take on their methods, you know, we, we might win, but we lose. Before the fight, you build personal integrity. I said, belt of truth. Before the fight, you learn how to treat others, and you do it. Our culture is horribly wicked in going back almost. I, I'm surprised they don't go back to um, conception on some of these guys and say, well, you know you were bad when you were conceived. It, it's amazing. Go back 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, as if nobody gets a chance to grow. But that just shows how unfair the battles are. So the sooner we can nail this righteousness down, the better off we're going to get. You know, can they go, can, don't answer this. If somebody really wanted to nail you to a wall and had all the resources of, say, our government, could they go back and could they find stuff where you were unrighteous? Yes. Absolutely. Not us, but you'll probably know some folks. <laughs> you, know, you know, by God's grace, he hemmed me in pretty good growing up. Was I a perfect child? Of course. <laughs> No, not even close. But the more righteousness we can have. Now, by the way, it's not saying that holiness is not important. It's God is, but that's not what God's dealing with right here. How do we treat each other? How do we treat the enemy? What do they see in our lives? Do they see uh, an ethical, an honest uh, behavior uh, that very behavior will defend us against Satan's attacks because the battle is not going to be fair it never is you're going to be lied about uh, you're going to have some things you've passed are going to be terribly exploited far beyond what they should ever have been the more righteousness personal righteousness you have the more you will be protected. And if you haven't got start today. Start today. Uh, this is so important. How we behave toward each other. This is part of God's armor. Uh, and again, the basic meaning of that word righteousness refers to integrity, honesty, ethics. How we treat each other. We are rapidly running out of time this morning I think we're a good place to stop we'll pick up here next week but what I want us maybe to, to really grab a hold of is how much of this is your and my responsibility uh, and it, it really makes sense if we will set aside spiritual nonsense this is called an armor there's a reason for that because there's a correlation Spiritual battles, there's a correlation. And at the, bottom, at the end of the day, whether a soldier wins or loses is pretty much up to the soldier. Now, I know there's, you, you've got a, your company and you've got the, the, the squad and all that, but whether I choose to armor myself, where I choose to train, where I, that's going to, that, that is, that's ultimately what's important. So don't have the idea that we can sit and go forth, not be trained, not really be committed because after all, it's all of God. It is not, it never has been. From creation, God created mankind to be responsible. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, you see that, responsible. And also, since creation, when mankind obeys God, the blessing is beyond imagination. In 
we're living in example. I will promise you, our founding fathers, who were all dominated by the Bible, every one of them, some of them not saved, but all dominated by the Bible, they never conceived the greatness that this country has become. God blessed far beyond the cost. He still does. So what are you doing today? First off, are you on God? Are you saved? Are you, are you in God's family? If you're saved, was there a point in time where you said, God, you can count on me? I am beginning to understand the cost I'm going to pay it. I'm willing to substitute what you want for what I want. I'm willing to pay the price for that kind of life. And God, I'm going to put my eyes on you and I'm going to follow you. Wherever you lead me. That's the beginning, not the end. Then equip yourself. Put on the armor. Grow strong. Get to know Jesus. All those things we've been looking at the last several weeks, we've got in front of us some. You've got to do it. And we, as God's children, there is an urgency. We can't survive another generation like the last two or three we've done as Christians. I hate to say that, but you young'uns, you, man, you got to be saved and you got to get me, you got to do it. I think you're going to have some of those old guys supporting you and going along with you, but man, there's an urgency for each one of us, the generation we're a part of, where we commit ourselves, God, I will do my best to reach my generation. That's the battle. You see, ultimately, how do you know you're winning? When those in Satan's army get saved, they become part of God's. That's what it's all about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the warnings of your... Father, this is a tough passage. It does lay the responsibilities where we don't like it. At least I don't. It lays the responsibilities at our feet. You've promised to supernaturally empower them. But Lord, it's not all you, it's our commitment and your power and your leadership. The victories will come as if you alone were working, and then you reward us as if it were all of us. But Father, I pray that each one of us here this morning would know you as Savior, and that when our battles in our lives are ultimately over, we'll be standing. We'll be victorious. We'll have won. So Lord, give us that commitment this morning and then drive us to preparing for the battles that will bring that kind of victory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of those studies where I, I'm really not sure how to frame the invitation. You know, I, I'm convinced that every time God's word is open, it demands a decision from each one of us. I think God brought you here to do with your heart to bring you to a decision of some kind. And my prayer is that you'll obey him. You'll do what God's saying. For some here, it may be to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe if... Everybody thinks you're saved. Maybe you think they do think it, but you know you're not. Please, don't take a chance on going to hell because you're embarrassed. This is the most accepting place. If you trust Christ as Savior, everyone in here will rejoice. If you're not saved, you need to trust Him. How do you do that? You come to God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that separates me from you, but I also honestly believe that Jesus paid the price for my sins. He died for me. He rose from the grave showing he paid enough. And God, will you forgive me because of my faith in Jesus? If you will honestly say that to God and mean, he'll forgive you. He'll forgive you forever. But that's the beginning. If you were to stand before God this morning, would he salute you as one of his followers? Or would he just talk to you because you're not in his army? I want victory. I want to win battles. That means I've got to get in. I've got to prepare. And this church has got to be a boot camp 
This has got to be uh, where you learn specialties and all that. We have got to be well prepared because the battles out there are going to surprise you. You've got to be prepared beforehand. Let's win some battles.